FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. And joining me on the line today again is Nicole Bilsma. Nicole is a woman of passion, and her passion lies in environmental medicine. As a result of her own infertility issues, that's 10 miscarriages, and noticing a strong connection between many of her patients' illnesses and their home, Nicole established the building biology industry in Australia, and in 1999 founded the Australian College of Environmental Studies to educate people about the health hazards in the built environment. And you can find more out about that at aces.edu.au. Nicole is an accomplished naturopath and acupuncturist of over 15 years. She's trained over 2,000 naturopaths at various institutions. She's the author of the best-selling book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family, and currently writing her third edition of this, which is due out in May 2017. She's published in peer-reviewed journals. She's a past columnist for Body and Soul newspaper. Nicole has appeared on every major television network and is regularly consulted by the media to discuss electromagnetic fields, mould and toxic chemicals. Nicole lectures extensively throughout Australia and abroad, educating integrative GPs about environmental health issues. She has three young children and is currently finishing off her PhD on environmental chemical assessment. And lastly, Nicole has also just finished a chapter for the textbook Advanced Clinical Naturopathic Medicine, now in its third edition by Leah Heckman, a chapter on environmental medicine. You are truly dedicated to this field, Nicole, and I welcome you back to FX Medicine. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thanks, Andrew. Good to be back. Now, we're going to be discussing something which I've got so many questions about. And that is electromagnetic fields, something which you specialize in. And, you know, Mm -hmm. the evidence sort of tips one way, then tips the other. So I guess we got to start at the beginning. What are we talking about here here when we're talking about electromagnetic fields? Okay, so electromagnetic fields is probably the most complicated area that we address as building biologists, as, as building biologists, because... When we talk EMFs, we're talking about waves. And we need to start at the beginning, which is terrestrial radiation, which is what we've naturally evolved on. So there are natural sources of electromagnetic fields, such as the Earth's magnetic field or geomagnetic field. We have radioactivity that comes from both cosmic radiation as a result of exploding uh, planets in the galaxy and X-rays from the galaxy, as well as radioactivity within the Earth's crust, uranium, for example, thorium, potassium. We also have the sun's energy, we have gravity, and of course we have the Schumann's resonance. So all of these frequencies combined are what we've evolved on since time began or since man was on this planet. And we really don't know the exact role this has to play, but we do know, for example, with the NASA program that when um, astronauts went to um, the moon, when they didn't replicate the human resonance within the capsule, that this they suspect cause things like depression and other health problems. So we're starting to realise that the energies that we've evolved on are a really important part of who we are as humans. Certainly we know that animals like termites, birds, fish, cows, deers, bees, ants, they are really rely on the geomagnetic field or the Earth's magnetic field for both the magnetic alignment and migration and homing of various animal species. So um, this is a really important part of who we are. And because technology yet has not really defined the true role that this terrestrial radiation has, Unfortunately, what we've done is we've implemented and dumped a huge amount of man-made forms of electromagnetic fields that we have not seen in our evolution, mm. that we're only now coming to terms with what impact that's having on human health. Can I, can I go back there? You mentioned resonance of humans in the NASA the capsule, you know, the space capsule. The human resonance. What? Tell me more. 
The Schumann resonance is basically created from as a result of all the thunderstorm activities that is occurring at any given time on this planet. It's creating frequencies within the atmosphere between the ionosphere and the, the planet Earth. Because of the amount of water we have on the planet, uh, that's the perfect way to create this uh, electromagnetic field. The most common frequency of the Schumann resonance is 7.83 hertz, which ironically is the same as the um, brain waves in the body. So it's an interesting thing that the Earth has created this frequency that is very similar to what you find in the human brain uh, in, in a state of relaxation. Now, it's the thunderstorms that are happening at any given time, of which there are thousands happening on the planet, particularly in the Amazon Basin and Southeast Asia and Sub-Sahara. Um, what you find is that this is creating this human resonance in our atmosphere. So how did they create that in a space capsule? Well, I don't know the technicalities behind it, but what they did is in the, the capsule itself is they had to create the similar frequency to prevent the astronauts from wow. becoming depressed. Wow. And and I just noticed you said 7.83 hertz. Yeah. Am I correct or not in thinking that relaxing the, these um, uh, musical pieces that are commonly agreed to be relaxing to many people, regardless of whether they like classical music or not, like Packle Bell's Canon in G, um, is that true that they sort of resonate at that? Is it 7 to 14 hertz? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so that's the... I never remember. I think it's the alpha waves in the brain. Right. It's that state of relaxation just before you go to sleep or when you're meditating. It happens to be the same frequency, and I think that's an huh. interesting, you know, is that a coincidence or is it because it's such an important part of our evolution and who we are as humans? So, yeah. so when we're talking about this, look, I've got to say the sceptic in me wakes up. How serious is this risk and what, what are the risks? And, you know, given that Western society is exposed to them all the time with our modern technologies... What are we seeing here? Are we seeing clusters? Well, if you have a look, we're starting to get a better idea now of the mechanism of action at a cellular level. And this has been mm. the problem because we haven't understood what's happening at a cellular level in order to be able to see and understand its impact on human health. Certainly we've known for a long period of time that it affects melatonin, which of course is the most important antioxidant-free radical scavenger we have in the body that makes any vitamin or mineral look like it's not doing anything in comparison to this remarkable neurotransmitter. The first concerns about electromagnetic fields were actually brought to light in military personnel on radar bases during World War II, but later on in electrical workers involved in the telecommunications industry. And a lot of the reports in the telecommunications industry have never been published. <laughs> But it wasn't wow. until 1979 when two researchers, Wertheimer and Leeper, published their research on high voltage transmission lines and its relationship to childhood leukemia that concerns about EMFs on public health came to the fore. So what they discovered was they went to the hospital and said, okay, give us all the addresses of children who've been diagnosed with leukemia in the late 70s. And they went to their homes and just looked and they noticed that most of these children live near high voltage transmission lines. So they employed an engineer to develop a device, which we now know is a Gauss meter, to actually measure the AC magnetic field from the power line. And they discovered that if children were exposed to three milligauss or higher, that their rate of uh, childhood leukemia doubled. It wasn't until 2000 when two pooled analyses uh, research reviews came out by Album and Greenland that conclusively indicated that exposures to 3 milligauss or higher was associated with a, a doubling the incidence of childhood leukemia that the International Agency for Research in Cancer um, then classified AC magnetic fields as a possible um, human carcinogen, a group 2B carcinogen. And that was in the year 2000. Now, the interesting thing about the field that comes from high-voltage transmission lines, it's generated from current. So any movement of electrons that happens when you, an appliance is in use. So, for example, you've got your table lamp, you turn it on, and then there's electrons moving through the wire and then, of course, through the, the lamp itself. And that creates what we refer to as current, and it's the current that creates the magnetic field. This drops off quickly with distance and most of the time it's not a problem. But in a home, if you sleep on the other side of the wall of a meter panel, that magnetic field can be more than 500 milligauss depending on how many appliances are on 
or how many lights are on or if the oven is on, which generates the most amount of current, um, as to how much of the field comes out of the wall from the meter panel. And that's where my journey began, you know, moving into the house, sleeping on the other side of the wall of a meter panel, not sleeping very well within weeks of moving in and then having 10 miscarriages, which you know, did the 10 miscarriages be caused by the magnetic field? We don't know. There's only about three research studies to indicate that, yes, it could, which is really not a lot of research and there's not a lot of research on it, unfortunately. But it certainly affects melatonin and affects the immune response. So that's where my journey began because of this. So in this research with Wertheim and Reaper, they found that three milligauss or higher could double the incidence of childhood leukemia if the child was raised within the first 15 years close to these, within 600 metres of the lines. But this can be easily replicated if children sleep near the other side of the wall of an oven and the oven is on, say a cot. Wow. Or if they're sleeping near a metre panel, you could get over 600 milligauss sleeping near a metre panel. And during the night time when you don't have appliances on, a lot of your off-peak appliances kick in in the middle of the night during REM time. You're doing during 3 to 5 in the morning when you should be on, in REM sleep. So, you know, um, sleeping near a metre panel, sleeping near an inverter, sleeping near a fridge whose motor's going on and off all night as it's calling the fridge, um, sleeping near a digital clock radio within 30 centimetres of the bed, they, they all emit very high AC magnetic fields which quickly drop off with distance. So many times we've walked in and we're going and the, the client's saying, the child, my child doesn't sleep, it's never slept. And lo and behold, their cot's on the other side of the wall, the fridge, whose motor's going on and off all night and all day. Um, just moving them to the other side of the wall within a metre away from that source and all of a sudden they're sleeping well because their melatonin levels are starting to acclimatise. And this is the thing that shocked me as a building biologist, simple things that made such dramatic impacts on people's health, especially with sleep, because we know magnetic fields and radio frequencies used in wireless technologies affect melatonin. Well, what, what's the proposed mechanism of action or pathology here? That's a good question. The irony is the mechanism of action has actually been used for diagnostic purposes in medicine, magnetic resonance imaging, electrocardiogram, electroencephalogram. Mm. It's used for a wide range of treating disorders like neonatal jaundice, depression, pain-related disorders, osteo, degenerative joint problems, wound healing. Electromagnetic fields have been used for diagnosis and treatment of many conditions. Now, the, the mechanism by which electromagnetic fields can induce protective effects and the way they suspect it induces these positive benefits is that it actually stimulates um, the production of free radicals, which results in the production of antioxidant enzymes to counteract them. Yeah. And it's this fine balance that creates this either protective or damaging effects. So it's a paradox that the mechanism by which it can induce protective effects and bone healing effects is also similar to the way it can cause harm. So let me just explain briefly. Yeah. The cell membrane is hydrophobic. It consists of iron pumps to prevent the movement of ions across the membrane. What we now know about electromagnetic fields is that they can cause bio biological effects by activating what they call L-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the cell membrane, allowing calcium ions to come in. Now, when you allow calcium ions to come in, it activates nitric oxide synthase enzymes that results in the production of nitric, ox uh, nitric oxide. And that can lead to two, one of two weight things. Nitric oxide sign signaling, which can have a therapeutic bone healing effect, or if it reacts with superoxide ion, it can result in the um, production of very reactive peroxy nitrite free radicals, which cause harm. So low levels of these free radicals will activate antioxidant enzymes like superoxide dismutase, catalase, etc., whilst high levels will inactivate them, resulting in an increase in the steady state oxidative stress. So in short, it causes oxidative stress and that leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA strand breaks, and it's the DNA strand breaks which are potentially the mechanism by which they can induce um, cancers like gliomas and acoustic neuromas. So... I'm just transposing electromagnetic frequency in my mind and putting in things like inflammation or sugar into those exact sentences and coming up with the same sort of health issues. The differential here is chronicity. So if it's an acute phase response, it can be a healing response, but chronically it basically wears your protective systems out. Is that is that right? Am I on the right wavelength? Oh, forgive that, the pun. That is <laughs> forgive exactly the pun. right. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> 
<laughs> that is exactly right. And you know what? When you look at all of these illnesses, whether it's electromagnetic fields, chemicals, heavy metals, um, stress, it's oxidative stress at a cellular level and low-grade inflammation on a systemic level. Yeah, yeah. It's the same mechanism. Personally, I think we need to rewrite naturopathy. We need to rewrite medicine and going, okay, let's talk about inflammation. Where is my patient at on the inflammatory scale and how do we bring them back to a state of this perfect balance between antioxidants produced and inflammation? Mm. Inflammation is an important part of being healthy because mm. the inflammation stimulates um, the antioxidant enzymes. Yeah, yeah. So inflammation is really important, but it's all about that balance. And that's where we're starting to realize that electromagnetic fields and pretty much everything, it's causing this low-grade inflammation. On top of that, EMFs can also affect the tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier. So often you see the symptoms of electromagnetic sensitivity are identical to chemical sensitivity and mold sensitivity because when you enhance the blood-brain barrier, it's permeability, all of a sudden all the heavy metals and chemicals that are already sitting in your fat tissues and your bone is getting a free ride straight into the central nervous system. So you can't separate electromagnetic field exposures to chemical exposures to heavy metals and mold exposures because they're all interrelated and affecting the body in a very similar way. I've got to ask, I've read write-ups though when they're talking about increased risk from things like temporal lobe brain cancer, um, tumours, and then there's, you know, six months later there's a paper saying there's no increased risk. And then there's another one in another two years or something saying, yeah, there's increased risk. I've seen this even locally from, I think it was a Royal Brisbane Hospital. Yeah. So the, why do the opinions vacillate so wildly? What's going on with it is, it isn't? What, what's happening here? Okay. There are many, several reasons why this is an issue. Firstly, the incidence of head tumours, it, it's, co it's coinciding with an increased rate of cell phone subscription. Although there are significant disparities about the rate, even amongst researchers from the same country, Part of the problem is the way the data is collected. So many studies, including you know the Australian and Danish Cancer Registry, analysed data well before cell phones came were adopted by the general public. It was in 2005 when the mobile phones were actually adopted by many people within the public. So because the latency period of these tumours are 15 to 25 years, we haven't even reached critical mass when we should be looking at the data. It's only going to be in the late... Uh, 2020s when we potentially if there's going to be a tsunami of brain tumors that it's likely to happen then because the uptake of 3g didn't happen until 2003 2005 in most western countries yeah. and it's 15 to 25 years latency period so the fact that we could be even seeing clusters now of course is also a concern um, so part of the problem is the cancer registry, registries are often not updated and they call this late ascertainment, mm. which is very common and it's associated with a data lag of th up to five years. Oh, heaps, yeah. Also, because the amount of autopsies that they're not doing, uh, brain tumour diagnosis on autopsy is declining, so it's very difficult to, to look at cancer registries. They can be unreliable for use in epidemiological studies for that reason. Now, there have been a lot of studies and a lot of reports correlating an increased risk of glioma and acoustic neuroma, which are two unusual forms of brain tumours with cell phone use. Mm. The three big studies on this were the Interphone study in Europe, the Serenat study in France, and Hardell, uh, Professor Leonard Hardell's research in Sweden, which identified in all those studies that if you use your mobile phone for 30 minutes a day, minimum 30 minutes a day, on one side of the head for 10 years that your incidence increases by either 40%, 100%, or 170%, depending on which of those three studies you look at. The reason why a lot of these studies um, indicate that there's not an issue is, you know, there's several reasons. You've got um, a conflict of interest in, you know, who's funding the, the research, and that's a huge problem yes, yeah. um, in this particular field because, um, you know, if they're giving the funding and then they choose not to publish research that shows adverse health effects, so the public never knows what's actually going on. Yeah, that's right. We, you, you don't look at the data and there's no data, and so therefore it's a, a non issue. It's, it, 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 it's be, kind of right. like how many people are out of work. Uh, sorry, exactly how, how, right. how many people are out of work and looking for work? If they're not yes. looking for work, they're not on the radar. There we go, everything's rosy. 
<laughs> exactly. Also, it's very difficult to compare studies because there's differences in study design. So the frequency that's that's tested, because with radio frequencies used in mobile phone research, depending on the carry, it could be 1,800 megahertz, could be 900 megahertz. It varies whether you use Vodafone or Telstra or Optus. Mm. The intensity and duration of exposure varies, and that makes it almost impossible to compare studies. We know there's a very long latency period associated with primary brain tumours, um, and but virtually there is no study to date that actually uses actual exposure data. So what they're doing is saying, they're asking the child, how often do you use your mobile p- phone? It's self-reported cell phone use and data. Or they're looking at the service provider and basing it on that. So people aren't actually doing exactly how much radio frequencies were you exposed to, even though there are apps to accurately assess exposures. The other problem with the research is that the age of first exposures is critical. So children, you know, it's unethical to put a yeah. an RF device near a child's head and, and a lot of universities won't give you ethics approval and yet it's launched into our schools and into our homes. And yet, you know, it's hard to get funding for this research because the research that has been done is showing that the age of first exposures is really important because there's a higher rate potentially of brain tumour risk if it's used well before the age of 15. Mm, I, yeah. I, I, I know we don't like it because it's a sort of, it, it hurts our hearts basically as natural health practitioners, but what about work on animals? Well, yes, and look, there, there's a lot of problems with EMF research on animals because it's very difficult to, especially with the blood-brain barrier permeability, they're very different. You can't compare rodents with, that, with humans at all. Well, oh, big, okay. Yeah. The, another one that's a problem is that a lot of psychologists that are employed by the telecommunications industry, including here in Australia, which I won't mention, uh, are using feeling studies and provocation studies. So they put people who, are, they, who say that they're electric, electromagnetic sensitive in a room and then they turn the RF device on. And if they can't pick it up or don't experience immediate symptoms, they're saying, See, this is why yeah. it's not a problem, yeah. which is just a whole lot of BS. Well, we've just answered it, that before with chronicity. So it's it's not an acute sort of phase response. It's Exactly. And in the animal studies, they're finding there's a two to three day acclimatisation or immune washout observed in animals. And because histamine is involved, many of the cellular effects are an increase in histamine. And like allergies, it's generally a delayed response. So the fact they're pouring millions of dollars into these provocation studies run by psychologists to prove that EHS doesn't exist is just a waste of resources and unfortunately showing time and time again how useless it is. But, you know, it's a trillion-dollar industry. I mean, you're stepping on big toes here. Yeah, and this is – look, this is is why I vacillate between that conspiracy theory and it's like I have this favourite sentence that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're not being followed. And you sort of (laughs) – you have to ask the question – if they're asking the wrong questions, and we know that they're asking the wrong questions, yep. why are they asking the wrong questions? They're either stupid or mischievous. Yeah. And so I'm going to I'm going to go with they're not stupid. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that leaves one other answer, yeah, and that's yeah. my concern: is that if they're not stupid, why are they? What What's the mischief? Like, what's going on? You know, this is this is my issue, and I, I haven't answered it. I'm, this is why I guess I ask questions on FX Medicine more for myself than any of our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got to ask then. So, if we're talking about chronicity of exposure, mm. is it as simple as taking off the lead of the computer or turning it off at the power switch, turning off your mobile phone or putting it more than ten foot away or something like that? You know. Is it as simple as moving the bed three foot, four foot, six foot away from a wall that might that where you might have the um, the fuse box on the other side? Yes, it's distance. It's called the inverse square law, and hmm. basically, it's the physics of radiation states that as you double the distance away from the source of electromagnetic fields, you reduce your exposure by seventy five percent. So, for AC magnetic fields like meter panels, it's about moving a meter and a half away in order to reduce your exposure back to, to background levels. With the phone, because the antenna in the phone is the source and it's constantly tuning into the nearest cell tower, it's making sure you don't have your mobile phone against your head, that you actually use an earpiece or you use loudspeaker or you text instead of making calls and keep it away from your vital organs, your heart, your brain, your reproductive organs. 
if you're carrying it on yourself, you should either for a male if they have to put it on their person, so to speak, then they should have it in a shielded pouch. Um, that of course can be an issue if they want to maintain connectivity, because in a shielded pouch it means you're not going to be able to make or receive a call. We have digital dementia going on here. We are so obsessed with our technology and I love technology and I love the fact that I can move away from my office and still run my business. Awesome. But you need to understand that you you have to keep a distance from the source, otherwise it's going to affect melatonin. It's going to enhance blood-brain permeability. It's going to cause significant high levels of oxidative stress. So look at the bedroom first. It's the most important room of of the house because you spend 20 years of your life in there. Look under the bed, get rid of your electric blankets, make sure on the other side of the wall of your bed is no appliances that that would be in use while you're sleeping. Certainly not the meter panel, not an inverter, not a fridge, not an oven. Fridge and ovens, uh, oven is only an issue, of course, when you're cooking because it's when you're heating that the current is created. But for radio frequency sources, which we haven't gone on to yet, your mobile phone is one of them. These are wireless technologies. The router is a huge issue because yeah. when you buy it, it's the, the manufacturer has it at the highest setting, so it beams your entire house, your garden, and the entire neighbourhood. Therefore, this is the problem. You need to use hardwired cable options are your best option, so you're not using wireless. But if you have to use wireless or you live with other people that need it for whatever reason, then at least turn it off when you're not using it. And secondly, power it down. Get onto the manufacturer's website put in the code of your router and power it down by 95%. So it's only beaming in the rooms that you need internet connectivity Mm. rather than the entire house and the garden. The other thing is keep it away from where you spend time. So don't have it in your office or your bedroom. Put it in a formal living room or a spare bedroom or in the garage. So it's not... Yeah, because the closer you are to it, the higher the levels of radio frequencies. Yeah. And I'm, I'm constantly finding is when people, when I go into people's homes and their router is on the desk where they're working, they're getting the start of symptoms of electromagnetic sensitivities are headache, you know, this profound headache that they can't get rid of. Mm. It comes and goes. Um, and then, of course, the sleep disturbances happen later on, etc. So they need to keep the router away from rooms where they're spending a lot of time and they need to switch it off when it's not in use. Because with radio frequencies, as you go up the electromagnetic spectrum, you don't have electric and magnetic fields like you do with the extra low frequencies that we talked about with the current through the building wiring and appliances. So you need completely different testing equipment to test it and you have to have, you need to understand where that radiation and the the, um, field is coming from. So the main thing you need to do is to look at where you spend time, your office, make sure your devices are at least a metre away. The exception is your computer monitor screen. It will emit virtually no electromagnetic fields because it complies with the TCO Swedish standard, which is fantastic. So your screens are generally not a problem. Mm. The computer box, however, will emit a bit of a field, but within a metre, within 30 centimetres, it's going to drop off to background levels. So that's great. Wireless routers is a big problem. Cordless phones are the two big problems you're going to have in the home. Cordless phones will emit uh, radio frequencies 24 hours a day, even when you don't use your cordless phone. Yeah. And you can pick it up from the floor below and the floor above. Right. So I strongly suggest people don't have cordless phones, especially in their bedrooms, because it's going to, you know, potentially affect melatonin and sleep disturbances, etc. And that's the one of the big ones that's showing in the research to be worse than mobile phones for brain tumour risk. As per any question <laughs> that you answer, I've got 20 more questions. So I'm going to try and break this up. But I guess the first one is, have you, have you or has anybody done any research to show differing of effect before and after, i.e. has avoiding EMF, particularly these um, low-frequency ones, ha- uh, routers, mobile phones, has taking those away been a, of benefit to patients? Not in a study that I've read, no. Right. This would be clinical experience from us, you know, going into people's homes and reading about people with EHS and sensitivities, that this is what they do to be able to live in the world, is they simply just turn everything off. Yeah. Um, and the headaches go. So we would map with our building biology clients um, that, that, you know, within a week of being there, how are you sleeping now? And it's often dramatic. 
Right. You know, all of a sudden my child who hasn't slept for two years is sleeping for the first time in the night simply moving their cot wow. a metre to another wall. Like it's, you know, anecdotal. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, more research needs to be done. But unfortunately, getting funding that isn't a conflict of interest from the, the industry that's creating the problem is really oh, difficult. Well, it's an anti-money-making, um, you know, study, isn't it? So so it's very be very hard to get funding for an anti-money-making study. Um, yes. So what about testing? What about getting one of these Gauss meters? And I'll, I've got to ask also, with along with that, when would you first suspect that it might be EMF as opposed to some other cause of headaches or sleeplessness? It's normally a process of exclusion. So right, they've right. tried everything else. They've seen the natural therapist and they've tried everything and they can't. Yeah. They haven't made any difference. The big one for us is the symptoms began when they moved into that bedroom or when they moved into the home and significantly abate when they're out of that environment. And and so the on, time, the time lag for getting rid of those symptoms? Like if, let's say, they went away to a beach house for a holiday yeah. and they their headache abates over what? one, two, three days, what? Depending on how long it's been going on for, because if they're exposed to high levels by sleeping near a router for years, then, you know, the neurological effects are going to persist and then you don't get this better or worse symptoms, Mm -hmm. like with mould, for example. So, But when it's at the beginning, so you find that the headaches just stop and they don't get the headaches. And often, you know what it's like when you when you have patients and they come back and go, oh, I haven't noticed any difference in my health. And you go through what you went through in the first consultation. You go, okay, you had four headaches a week. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, I, I don't have any. H- headaches would be the best marker for finding out if something's worked because people always say, no, it hasn't worked. And yet when you say, uh, always write down how many headaches a patient has right at the first consultation. It's just amazing. They never remember how many they had. No, and this is why a good um, history is so important at the beginning of um, seeing a patient and then seeing how they progress over time. So with these clients, the headaches just generally disappear. Headaches, of course, can be due to lots of different things. This is just one of a potential whole list that could Mm. occur. But it's often they've seen every practitioner, they don't know what's going on, and then you notice in your question, oh, it's got worse since you moved into this house. It tends to be better when they're away from the home. But, of course, nowadays the big problem we have in science and electromagnetic fields is there's no control group. We have radio frequencies based over the entire planet now. Mm. So how do you have a control group when everyone's exposed? Go to space and don't pal- don't play pack a bell. No kidding. Um, <laughs> but I have to ask about the earpiece issue because I've heard it said, you know, years ago. Ah, oh, you know, I don't use an earpiece, and the reason is because it's concentrating the 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 waves into your ears. I'm going, hang on, that's sound waves. So yeah. they never gelled. But can you go through this and also these shields that you supposedly stick on a device to? protect you from it i i have issues with this i have big issues with that yeah great (laughs) they don't do anything (laughs) so unless they're creating this what we do know about how to attenuate exposures to these fields is distance that's it so know where the source comes from and create a distance between you and the source especially in areas where you spend time Put, I would say to clients, okay, you bought a disc, you plonked it on your phone. Can you still make or receive a call? And they go, yes. I said, it didn't work. Good you right. Okay. Still make or receive a call. <laughs> so that's a problem. Yeah. Um, what about think, testing though? What like can you get a Gauss meter cheaply, or do you have to spend like you know five thousand dollars on one? Or? Well, a Gauss meter is used to measure magnetic fields, and magnetic fields are created from anything that draws current. So anything plugged into the building wiring at the power point that's in use. That's going to generate a magnetic field. And it's not going to be a problem if it's, you know, a metre away from where you spend time. The exception, of course, would be the metre panel, which will be a bit longer. In terms of radio frequencies used in wireless technologies, your mobile phones, your cordless phones, your wireless routers, your wireless baby monitors, your wireless alarm systems, you need a high-frequency metre to measure that. Our high-frequency metres start at about two grand. Right. And they're right. very difficult to use. We spend a year of this in the uh, uh, building biology course. And the reason is because, say, for example, you have a mobile phone tower, it's the radio waves are coming in through the window because it goes through glass. It then bounces off the wall in the room because there's sarking or foil insulation. Yep. Metal will reflect RF. So you get your meter and you fire those high levels. 
But when you point the antenna, you notice it's coming off a wall that has no source of RF right. because it's coming through the window, bouncing off the sarking in the roof or the metal roof or the foil insulation in the walls and then reflected back into the room and bouncing and reflecting everywhere. So, so, so is that – here's my question, though, with that. Is that not creating or uh, basically negating any type of, you know, distance that you're moving the bed from this source? Well, it means that you potentially could have hot spots in that room that you're never going to know about without the meter. Right, right. That's the issue. You need to know with RF, you use a very different meter, which is, is directional as opposed to AC magnetic, the Gauss meter, which isn't. It's a three-axis digital ah, Gauss meter. I see what you mean. So an RF meter is directional. So we know where that RF is coming from so we can then make recommendations to address it. If it's coming from an external source, so for example, two years ago, I did an audit of a home in Northcote. She was diagnosed with many years disease. It was developed and she her health symptoms declined significantly when she moved into this beautiful double story home that they built. Within six months of moving in, um, she developed many years. And then six months later, her husband developed many years syndrome. Like, what's the chances of that? Wow. Anyway, so I'm upstairs and I'm checking because they said, look, we don't know what's happened, but when we go to our holiday house, we get better. But when we're here in our house in Northcote, we are both really bad. And we've noticed when we sleep downstairs in the spare bedroom, our symptoms get better. So I went upstairs and did the whole house. And upstairs, they have three windows on three walls. And I can see five mobile phone towers from their master bedroom. And when I point my antenna to them, we're, we're talking frequencies above 2,000 microwatts per square metre, which is, which is high from a building biology perspective. And I said, whatever I'm picking up here now at 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon is nothing compared to what you're going to be exposed to at night time because they're close to High Street, Northgate, and you've got nightclubs there. People are using their mobile phone even more, which means the mobile, the radio frequency fields coming from those mobile phone towers are going to be magnified because more people are using their phones and Facebooking, whatever else they're doing in a nightclub, et cetera. Right. So huge amounts of radio frequencies coming into this home because they had windows on three out of the four walls and high levels. Now, can I say that caused their many years? No, no one can say that conclusively. No, no. But it's an interesting coincidence that it developed then in two different genotypes, husband and wife, and, and the symptoms improve when they're away from it. Double stories in built-up areas are a real problem we're finding because they, they're closer to the mobile phones, they're at a similar level, and um, it's coming through the windows and then, of course, being reflected within the room. So these are a reason why a lot of the building biologists now who go through the course don't live in multi-storey apartments because they can't control their environment. Yeah. The router underneath them from the client underneath them or above them or next um, to them is beaming across their entire apartment and short of shielding the entire room, which costs a lot of money and it's not always effective, it's very difficult to have control over your environmental space. Right. C can I ask then about, you know, host response? Like you've got, um, I, know, I know it might be, there is that issue of distance when you're talking about two people in a bed, but, you know, let's say it's a, a queen size bed and let's say the uh, the heads of the people are equidistant from the fuse box that's sitting on the other side of the wall, but in the middle in between those people. Um, and yet only one gets the symptoms. So we've got to look at then the host response. What, Absolutely. What do you find? Like, what do you tend to look for? Do you tend to look at the general health of the person, what their general background of resilience is, or uh, what do you tend, how do you differentiate between these people? Okay. So we look for a history of high or long-term exposure to electromagnetic fields. We look at what's immediately around there, particularly where they spend time, bedroom, office, what their job is, occupation. We're also looking at exposures to chemicals because many of the symptoms of uh, electromagnetic sensitivities are actually associated with chemicals because of the capacity of EMF to enhance the brain's permeability to the chemicals. Chronic sleep deprivation, stress, that can be a big precursor as well in terms of um, susceptibility, but the big one is heavy metals. The higher the heavy metal oh. load in the body, the more it acts as an antenna to electromagnetic fields. So amalgams are a huge one because they're leaking small amounts, sometimes higher uh, levels, um, and particularly TMJ-related problems, temporomandibular joint problems, especially if they use... Uh, we'll ask how often they use their mobile phone, you know, 
and of course that potentially could be having an effect of enhancing um, leakage of mercury from uh, amalgams. Their fish content, if they're eating fish every week, that potentially could be high in metal load, um, uh, the exposures to fungicides, all of those sort of things. So heavy metals is a big one. That, that's where hair mineral analysis and, and um, provocational urinary tests can be quite useful to determine that their susceptibility. The other one is surgical metal implants. Titanium implants, especially in the spine, can be a disaster for people exposed to radio frequencies because huh. it acts as an antenna. And we've had some people who've rung us who are suicidal after the surgical metal implants because they literally cannot go into a room where there's a router because they it just literally lights them up. Really? And they think they're going nuts. Yep. Um, epigenetic factors. We know people with atopy, so people with hay fever and allergies, are more likely to be susceptible to um, electromagnetic fields. And, of course, more importantly, children, the unborn fetus, the elderly, the immunocompromised, this is the first generation to be exposed from the prenatal period to electromagnetic fields for the first time in the history of mankind. So we're waiting to see what impact that has. So apart from, I mean, this is the whole thing, I guess, with being in the 21st century. We can't go back. We won't go back as a society, as a, no. a dare I use that word, civilization. But anyway, um, we're not going back. We have to go forward. Yes. You've mentioned the practical application of just moving, just just moving a cot or a bed inside that room and seeing if it makes a difference. Yes. Turning, you know, powering down the the um, wireless devices in the home. Mm -hmm. I I see issues with that with our connectivity, with our need for for constant connectivity. But but I guess it's worth a try. What other things can you like? Do you look at diet? Do you look at? Oh, for sure, you have to look at diet. Definitely. Mm. I mean, you know, as I said, a lot of symptoms are related to chemical exposures as well. So you need to look at, uh, you know. SNPs in detoxification and oxidative stress pathways. You need to look at nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics and its capacity to enhance the um, well-being. You have to look at the whole system. You have to look at the whole person because this is, of course, what creates the problem. A lot of the SNPs in the past, a lot of the SNPs that we have that we're finding, MTHFR, you know, detoxification pathway SNPs, etc., they weren't an issue in the past because we weren't exposed to all of these chemicals. We weren't yeah. exposed to all these heavy metals. We weren't exposed to all these electromagnetic fields. These, the environment has now brought all of our weaknesses to the fore because how does the body deal with this? This is where these SNPs become relevant. But if you didn't expose them to all the chemicals in our air, our food, our water, our dental histories and our electromagnetic fields, then the SNPs become irrelevant. There's such a conundrum with all of this, isn't there? Like, how do we? We can't go back. And no, I guess, I, I guess, I yep. guess, the issue that we've faced is, when do we start to suspect an issue with EMF? You know, like where? At where do you prioritise it? Where would any? Like, you know, let's say a naturopath in Perth right now. Um, mm -hmm. How would they prioritise? these chronic headaches related to EMF rather than chronic headaches related to intestinal permeability, ATOP, misalignment, chronic fatigue. So where, how do you prioritise it? So I look at all the obvious first with headaches, you know, hyperglycemia, sugar, diet, really important. And the first consultation is taking a really thorough history, including place history where they've lived, Occupational history is really important as part of that as well, and hobbies, because that's where a lot of these environmental mm. factors come into yep. play. And then if they don't improve after four weeks, or depending on how long, you know, for every a year they've had the disease, takes a month of treatment, mm. etc., um, it's a process of exclusion. So I would really ask a lot of, in terms of place history, their proximity to traffic-related air pollutants, I look at their bedroom. I always start with their bedroom. Yeah. So tell me about your bedroom. What appliances do you have in your bedroom? Do Where do you charge your mobile phone? Like many people, especially right, the younger the generation, head, yeah. are putting them under their head. Yeah, yeah. And well, the constant. sleep apps. There's the sleep apps. <laughs> you know, get a restful sleep by putting the phone under your, under your pillow. It's just madness. How's that counterintuitive? But anyway... <laughs> Exactly. So you're asking about the most important room of the house is the bedroom. Because mm. if you don't get sleep, everything is irrelevant if you can't sleep because your immune system suffers. Everything suffers. So sleep is the key. 
and it's the one. The symptoms that come up the most with electromagnetic fields exposure is insomnia, headaches, uh, would be the two most common symptoms. Some people get some chest pain and tightness, etc. But the most common that I that flag me for EMFs is always the headaches and insomnia that's not improved by imp- enhancing or getting rid of their stress and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's a process of exclusion. Asking them, okay, tell me about all the appliances in the room. Where do you charge your phone? Do you have an electric blanket? What's on the other side of the wall of your bed? Where is the router in your house? Do you have a cordless phone? Simple questions like that are really important. In fact, they've got two really important guidelines for clinicians and doctors that were written by the Austrian Medical Association on guidelines on how to diagnose and treat electromagnetic hypersensitivity. So they're definitely worth getting that because it's such a useful document that was published in 2012 by the Austrian Medical Association. The other document that came out this year was by the European Academy for Environmental Medicine and they developed guidelines for doctors and practitioners, again, on how to diagnose and treat EMF-related health problems as a duty of care. Wow. So those two guidelines are excellent for practitioners to show you the symptoms associated with electromagnetic field exposures, um, the type of testing in terms of melatonin, and um, there's quite a lot. They go into quite a bit of detail. And um, what simple steps they can take to reduce their exposure. And, of course, I've got all of that in my book as well, Healthy Home, Healthy Family. I've got to say, you're blowing my mind with all of this stuff. I'm so on the learning cusp, on the lower end of the learning cusp of this. But I, I got to say, I thank you so much for taking me through the reasonable steps and debunking some of the myths because I do have this sort of scepticism to this sort of stuff. And you back everything you say up with good science. Now, I know that we're not there yet. So I've got to ask the next question. The last question is, where to now? Who's doing the next phase of research? Is there anybody? Not that I'm aware of. It's a real conundrum. We've got People like Leonard Howdow, who was the, the leading researcher on mobile phone use, you know, who's getting difficulty getting funding. You know, it, it's just, you look at these researchers and there's a handful of them around the world and they're getting, they're finding it hard to get research dollars to do the work. Yeah. And the people who are getting the researchers are psychologists doing provocation tests and they're getting the, the money from telecommunications. There's such a massive conflict of interest. I mean, I haven't even started to look at and tell you about the exposure standards and how the Tobacco Institute got even even involved in the setting of exposure standards here in Australia on oh electromagnetic God. fields. There's a beautiful um, PhD dissertation by Don Maish. He did his PhD on the conflict of interest in the telecommunic in the setting of the exposure standards in the telecommunications industry, and that is a really must read. His website is excellent, emfacts.com, and a lot of really good scientific evidence as to why. In light of the scientific uncertainty that we as practitioners need to educate our patients how to reduce their exposures, and it's simply distance. So, okay, so the practical thing is distance. EMF, sorry, it's not EMF facts, it's emfacts.com. EMFacts, sorry, yes. EMFacts.com. Again, we'll put that. You've given us so much to look at and to, to sift through. Awesome, Nicole. Thank you so much for taking us through this. This is really interesting. I've got to say a conundrum. You know, when would you suspect this? But I guess for those people that just aren't getting response for anything else, this is the next step. This is the next phase of, of intervention, of trying to find an answer for these chronic sort of health issues for people. Yeah, and look, I'm do, this is what I'm doing my PhD on. I'm developing a tool for practitioners to use to be able to identify environmental health-related factors <sighs> from chemicals and EMFs. And to be able to, you know, come up with a traffic light system as to toxicity, yep. and therefore also help them understand how to reduce their exposure by educating them. Well, I, I for one, can't wait till you finish your PhD, and um, I'll certainly be looking out for that paper. Can't, cannot wait. Awesome, lady. Thank you so much for joining us again on FX Medicine. Thanks so much, Andrew. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. This podcast was brought to you by the Australian College of Environmental Studies, aces.edu.au. If you're loving our FX Medicine podcasts, please don't forget to share us with your colleagues, family and friends.